What's going on, everybody? This is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over UFC. Is this 299? I'm, I lost track. I know it's not UFC 300. They're making a really big deal about that one. But nonetheless, it is a UFC card where they're paying six figures for first uh, in DFS. So we're going to take a look at it. Uh, as you guys may know by now, we do three different videos for uh, UFC. First, uh, we go over essentially who the best plays are. And that's going to be this video. We're going to go through each fight. We're going to talk about who has upside, talk about a little bit of the context of the slate, things like that. Uh, second video, which is tomorrow, Friday, is going to be a contrarian betting breakdown where we take a look at the fights from a, a betting perspective, but from a contrarian betting perspective where we try to get off of kind of like the chalk analysis and things like that, try to train our brains to think about things much more, you know, critically. And then the third video, which is probably going to be Saturday morning, is where we um, uh, focus completely on lineup construction, where we really try to figure out how we're going to take our knowledge of what the best plays are and turn them into you know, lineups that have a chance to win the big, uh, the big GPP at the end of the, you know, uh, first for six figures. But today we're going to go over the fights and we have a 13 fight card, which means that you do need to prioritize upside, uh, both in for favorites and for underdogs. It's not enough just to get the six, you know, just to get six for six. It usually isn't enough to get six for six. There have been cards, even 13, 14 fight cards where you had all favorites win, in which case you're going to have to find the best <laughs> the best performing underdog, uh, excuse me, the best performing loser. Um, and also in, in, in slates like that, if you do get that one win, it doesn't really matter what you score. It's going to be optimal, but usually in a 13 fight card, you do want to prioritize the underdogs that actually have some upside as well. Anyway, let's go right from the bottom and we'll just see what we can come up with here. So first fight we have, uh, Boy, I don't even want to get into pronouncing this one, but Gregorio versus Chad Emlinger. Chad Emlinger is a is is kind of he's a veteran. He's been been around the block, to say the least. And let's just you know, let's take a look at the numbers here. He's if Gregorio is eighty nine hundred to seventy three hundred. So typically, in salaries like that, we're we're looking for someone with the uh, inside the distance line of about about plus one hundred or so uh, to be somewhat viable. Unless he has significant, uh, what you would call it, uh, takedown upside. And let's take a look. Gregorio here, first of all, there's not a lot of line value. Actually, you could say that there might be a little bit of line value in, in Anlinger. I mean, he's only a plus 140 ish underdog. And being priced all the way down at 7,300, I mean, that's actually not bad. However, as I mentioned earlier, now, usually 13 fight cards, it's not enough just to have money line value, but it is something to consider. Um, so let, let's 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 note that by putting him in kind of like this dummy lineup for now. Let's take a look at the inside the distance line. So Gregorio inside the distance is let's see. Wait, it doesn't look like oh there it is. Anlinger you inside the distance plus 300. Gregorio plus 130. So he's close. I mean, he's close to being a good play, which means that we have to consider him, you know, because we don't know what else is going to be happening in the card yet. Uh, if nobody else looks good, then he could end up being a really, really good play. So, uh, and then interestingly, Ellinger plus 300 inside, that's actually not bad for this price. So I think that it's it's kind of irresponsible to dismiss this fight right off the bat. I think this fight could deliver depending on you know what the other fights look like. So let's 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 put these guys in here for now. And again, we're not playing both of them, but just you know to keep track of which guys we like. All right, Tiago Moises versus was it Manny Ramirez? So we have a $9,300 and $6,900 fighter. So we're expecting to see like three to one favorites here. And let's see. Um, 
Yeah, he's plus 370, upwards of plus four, of, of minus 370, upwards of minus 400. So that's obviously, you know, kind of, uh, it, it's commensurate with his price. It's, it's 9,300. I think it's very, very reasonable given his, his win odds. However, you need to make sure that the inside the distance line is proper. So for 9,300, you're going to need an inside the distance line of, I mean, at least minus 110, maybe, or preferably even better. Um, in addition to that, it would be nice to also have some takedown upsides. But let's, let's get into this a little bit. Ramirez, excuse me, Moises inside the distance is minus 140, right? That's very, very strong. So we like that. And if we look at his game logs, so to speak, he does have the ability to get takedowns. I mean, two fights ago, he had four. And then every other fight, he's, well, not every other fight. He, sometimes he has one. Sometimes he has zero. But in this one, we had zero. We had a first-round KO. So we'll obviously forgive him. This fight is a little annoying, where he won kind of a striking-based fight, scoring only 51 fantasy points. That one is uh, that one's very concerning because if you pay 9,300, you get that. You know, you're obviously not not doing very well. Um, but I don't know with his inside the distance line and the possibility for takedowns. I definitely think he's a very decent favorite. We'll put him in here. And the problem with Ramirez is is quite simply just doesn't win often enough. You know, if if you're gonna play a plus 400 underdog, it's got to be because his opponent has is extremely chalky, meaning you know a lot of people are going to play him so you can get leverage, um, or he's I mean he's really going to always make the optimal when he when he wins, and even his inside the distance line. Let's look at Ramirez and plus five twenty five. So Ramirez is just just doesn't win often enough for me to play him. So we're going to play Moises or nothing in this fight. Okay, uh, Corey McKenna versus Jacqueline Amarine. So whenever you have this $8,200, 8K fight, you have to really consider it uh, because you know, it just opens up so much, so many more possibilities in, in your lineups. And whoever wins the fight has got to score something, you know? Uh, so, yes, I mean, if, some, if, if the winner really busts and gets like a 60, then you're not going to be happy with it. But usually winners of fights score about 80 points at least uh, you you'll see some where they score in the 70s but usually you, you can squeak out like 80 points even if you don't have a complete smash performance so this 8200 hour 8k fight is always you know worth considering and the other thing about this fight which makes it sort of interesting is not so much the inside of distance line although let's take a look at it uh McKenna inside the distance is, you know, plus 600. That's not so great. Amarin inside the distance plus 160. I mean, that seemed pretty ridiculous. You know, uh, ridiculously good for a, for a, for a women's fight where you have an 8,200 hour 8K fight. So she's going to show up as an extremely strong play, not to mention the fact that I would say both of these fighters have takedown upside. So uh, Amarim, I actually don't even believe this inside the distance line. I think that when other props come out from other sites, it's not going to be quite as bad. Um, plus one six just seems awfully low, but hey, we're gonna we're gonna presume it's correct for now. And as a result for that, Amarim looks like a smash play, and because. She does look like a smash play. You'd imagine that a lot of the optimizers would pick her up. And, and as a result, Corey McKenna on the other side is probably some good leverage. Not to mention the fact that she has, you know, she has some event upside of her own. You know, even though she doesn't have a good inside the distance line, she certainly has some takedown upside. So, so this is a key fight. I mean, I really think that you're going to want to play both sides of this. Um, or more to the point, I think you're going to want to play at least one of these. This is not what I was thinking going into this uh, analysis, but numbers sort of don't lie here. And 
This is an extremely strong fight from a DFS perspective. Okay, uh, Josh Kulabal versus, not Daniel Silva, Danny Silva. 8,800 versus 7,400. Let's uh, double check the win odds here. It seems about right. Let's look at the inside the distance line. Josh Kulabau inside the distance is plus 240. For his price, that's not very good. Silva inside the distance for his plus plus 360, that's not very good. Neither one of them are wrestlers, so I think this fight is probably a pretty much a stone-cold pass. All right, you have, how do you pronounce this game? Oh, Jafiel Filio versus Ode Osborne. Uh, Filio, 8,700. Uh, versus 7,500 for Osborne. Filio is kind of known, among other things, for someone who, I don't say almost, but you could say almost subbed Mo, Mo, uh, Mohamed Makayev um, at 6,500. Makayev apparently just didn't mind having his leg broken as opposed to, as opposed to, uh, to getting, uh, to, to tapping out, and he ended up turning the tables and subbing Filio. And then I kind of got feel you're wrong. I, I I played Barres in the next fight because I do like to go against fighters who are getting love just because of their of their performance in a loss. Um, but Filio, I think he got knocked down, and then he just kind of turned the tables, I think, and just got the takedown and the submission. So um, he has does have a style edge in this fight because Osborne is not very good with his takedown defense. Uh, so you have someone who's a good sub guy with someone who doesn't really defend takedowns too well. This is a pretty good matchup for him. And I say that because I'm probably going to have to excuse the lack of an inside the distance line here. Let's take a look at it. Filio inside the distance, actually plus 100. I mean, that's pretty much all we need for his price anyway. Plus the fact that he has takedown upside. I and mean, this is a very, very strong uh, we do like Filio. Osborne inside plus 270. Um, not the worst. I mean, I think that when you get up to 150, uh, 150 maxing, you, you'll you certainly get some of him. Is Filio going to be popular enough where you can also make the case for Osborne by a leverage? Mm, maybe, maybe not. But I definitely think that Osborne is 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 viable. I mean, he's not a priority or for single entry or three max or anything like that. But I think you could play him in twenty max, and I think you could certainly play him in one fifty. So I think this is a pretty, I imagine, pretty low on underdog that's that's worth it. Josiah Nunez versus Chelsea Chandler. I mean, I imagine this is going to be a fight that we're not going to want to play, but we'll, we'll just take a look at it. Uh, Nunez, 8,400 versus 7,800. Now, we do have to be cognizant of, of the fact that this is one of those, you know, mid-range pricing fights. So you have to respect that somewhat. But I don't believe that either of these fighters have any kind of inside the distance line worth mentioning. So we'll take a look. So Nunez inside is actually, look at that, plus 165. Boy, oh boy, that's not bad. For that price. I mean, it's not like a smash or anything, but it's not bad. Chandler inside plus 300 at that price is not very good. Not to mention the fact that Chandler's been getting a lot of a lot of love as far as being a live underdog here. So I don't know, maybe people play Chandler and Nunez maybe. I was about to say Nunez to get some leverage, but are people really just not going to play her when, you, when they see a plus 165 inside the distance line? You know, I don't know. I, I think maybe I'll be with the field on, the, on Nunez, which I guess would be about 20% or so. And I, I think Chandler is probably going to be overowned to some degree because she, I mean, she can get a win, but a win at 13, you know, at 13 fights is not that big of a deal unless you have some degree of upside. Um and it's just a little worse of a spot than than this McKenna thing, right? Like McKenna, first of all, had some takedowns in her arsenal, and second of all, Amarim, I'd have to imagine, is going to be pretty like much higher on uh, than Nunez. 
but I don't know. So yeah, unfortunately, same hedge, same thing. Maybe for 150 max, I'll play some Chandler, but but probably a fade. And Nunez could be could be a little sneaky low owned uh, low owned player. So let's let's put let's put Nunez in. And again, we wouldn't be playing two of these fighters together. Just get an idea of what you know what what pricing looks like though. Um, one second. Okay, moving on. We have Mike Davis versus Natan Levy. Uh, 9,200 versus 7K, and the win odds reflect that. Actually, win odds, minus 400. I mean, this is... It's going to be tough to play Levy here. You know what I mean? Like, he just doesn't win too often. But but it's a very interesting dynamic because, first, first of all, let's look at the inside the distance line. First of all, you have Davis inside plus 145, not that big of a deal, okay? And Levy's, like, plus, like, a million. But it's, it's a fight where you have two wrestlers going after each other, okay? Um, and... You look at Natan Levy in his last, you know, every one of his fights. In his last fight, he had six takedowns. Fight before that, he had nine takedowns. Before, you know, the fight before that, he had three takedowns, even though he got a loss. So you're going to have one guy going for takedowns here. And then Mike Davis on the other side of this. Um, in his fight, he, he, he last, in his last fight, he had nine takedowns. And before that, he had three. And before that, he had two. Before getting, oh my God, two takedowns and two knockdowns. That's 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 very rare. <laughs> um, and that's how you get 134 points, by the way. So if I knew that Mike Davis was gonna, gonna get all these takedowns and route to a win, I, I would forgive his inside the distance line, which isn't that great, but here, there's there's a little more to this than meets the eye. So so in his last fight where he's got the nine takedowns, he's fighting someone who has really really poor takedown defense in Borshev. So it's it's I don't know how likely it is that he's going to be going for all these takedowns, especially when um, uh, especially when he's fighting someone who's also a wrestler. You know, Natan Levy might not be as good as 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 Davis overall, but at least Levy, that's what his his skill set is. So to ask Davis to get, you know, a takedown based win that smashes against Levy is really asking for quite a bit. You know, Mike Davis is is definitely listen, I'm I'm looking also at these two knockdowns to indicate that he probably also has some striking. I mean, it's possible that he just wins a striking-based decision. I don't know. 9,200 seems awfully cheap, uh, given his win odds and the takedown upside. But I don't know. I So far, I'm, I'm really not on any favorites that are kind of locks here. I have, there's something wrong with, with – something wrong. There's something fishy about all of them. And uh, – Nonetheless, I, I do think Mike Davis is obviously a good play. But we're going to have to see if anybody else shows up as better. Uh, and it's on Levy again. I just What I was going to say is if he does win, it's got to be because he gets takedowns. But how often does he win? It's like only one, like 20% of the time. Unfortunately, I, I got to hedge this again and say, listen, in 150 max and things like that, I think that it's uh, certainly a reasonable underdog because when he does win, I mean, he's just going to score. But he just doesn't win a lot. All right, here's another one. Another. This is going to be thematic for the next, like, 
two or three fights, this takedown upside stuff. So you have Gerald Nearshart versus Brian Barbarina. And Gerald Nearshart's 9,100 versus 7,100. So I'm expecting, again, to see a minus 250 or something like that or higher. He's actually minus 240. And you compare him to some of the other guys around his, his price, he actually has much, much weaker win odds. You know, he's um, he's only minus 240, where you have Mike Davis, for example, and only 100 more is minus 400. So, and then you had Moises around minus 400. You have, um, yeah. and we'll get to some others in a minute. But so as far as money line goes, Mearshart is not, you know, it's, it's not really that great. You look at the inside the distance line, though, and I believe he's minus 110. Yeah. So, so Mearshart is minus 125 inside the distance, which is extremely strong. Uh, and it's stronger than pretty much all the other ones that we've seen so far, right? Have there even been, well, I shouldn't say that. He's very similar to Thiago Moises. Moises was what, minus 140. So they're pretty much the same. And they're both probably similar with respect to their style. They're both submission grapplers. And they're both of their wrestling is, I guess, good enough. Um, so I think Mearshart's a very similar play to Moises, except for the fact that he doesn't win as often. Um, but I definitely think that he's very viable. And then the, the Brian Barbarina, it's, it's the whole thing is really fishy because the style matchup is so brutal for him. Okay. He can't defend any takedowns at all. And Mearshart would just love to get this to the mat. So it just feels as though. Barbarina has just no paths to victory here. I mean, he barely doesn't make weight a lot. He's just put on just nothing but miserable performances of late. And yet he's only like plus 190. You know, if, if I told the story to someone who doesn't know anything about MMA or whatever, whatever, they would think it's like a plus 800 or something. The fact that he's plus 195 makes it extremely fishy to me. I guess we'll talk about this in the betting breakdown video, but I don't know if anybody's going to actually have the, the the cojones to do this. But I think Barbarina is a good play. Um. Oh God. I mean, he's he's only plus two hundred to win. And even though I did say that, you know, you really want to prioritize upside. A plus 200 to win of a 7K fighter is, is nothing is nothing to sneeze at. So I, I know he's going to lose, but but you just kind of have to play it. I know what you're saying, but why would you do that? But that's the way DFS is sometimes. All right. Um, Macy Chason versus Penny Kian said, all right, we'll take a look at this. Women's fight, she's a minus 220 favorite, so I'm imagining about 9,100 or so. Uh, yeah. That's what we're getting, 9K. I imagine the inside the distance line is going to be poor. Certainly not the minus 110 we're going to need, no, plus 285. The only thing I would say is that a that, couple of things. Number one, she's got to be low-owned. I mean, she will be low owned. And number two, if you do look at her game logs or her fight logs, she does have some takedowns in her arsenal. I mean, she does have six takedowns against Norma Dumont, who's huge. Okay. Three takedowns against Irene Aldana. Um, three takedowns against Sh Shanna Young. And nothing wrong with, you know, losing to Raquel Pennington. So. She didn't have any takedowns prior to that, though. But if that's going to be her new thing, then, yeah, I mean, she could she could get there. Uh, she's going to be low-owned. But it's like that parlay. You know, like, like number, number one, you need her to want to get the takedowns, right? Number two, she has to get them. And then number three, they have to be enough to win. So it's kind of like... Yeah, she might have this this edge if she does go for the takedowns, but she then has to actually want to do it. Remember, just because we sort of would want her to do it in DFS 
doesn't mean that that's what she would want to do. <laughs> it doesn't mean that that's what her trainer is going to instruct her to do. We just don't know. As far as Kian's side goes, um, just doesn't score that well in wins and, and doesn't win a lot in the spot. So probably not. And not to mention that uh, Chiasan is probably not going to be that highly owned. So it's uh, probably a pass for me. Isaac Dolgarian versus Christian Rodriguez. So I imagine this is going to be one of the more popular fighters on the card. You have Isaac Dolgarian is minus 170. And there's a little bit of line movement as well. Um, at 8,500, you expect to see a little bit less, but it's not even that. He just finishes every freaking fight, and he goes for takedowns. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look at the inside the distance line here. But plus 160, I, th I thought it was going to be I thought it was going to be more aggressive than that. Um, but when you factor in that, you also it's going to be coming with takedowns. I mean, it's a very very strong play. I mean, in his wins. He just rates the score extremely well. Um, and so it brings us to something we usually talk about just on the line of construction video, where you have, which is pretty well accepted as a great play. And as a result, you're probably going to want to take a look at the underdog here or the, or the other, you know, the, um, the, uh, the opponent. Because if everybody's going to see this, then he's going to be very popular. And if somehow you can get this win on the other side of this, you're going to get a lot of leverage. The only thing is, is you have to really make sure that he's at least a decent play on his own. You can't just play him just for leverage. He's got to be at least decent. And if he is, it's a very, very strong play. And I can tell you, I just don't, I don't think I like these inside the distance lines here. You have... Rodriguez inside the distance plus like 330. I mean, ouch. I mean, it's fine, I guess, but it's not great. It's something I'd wanted more of like a 7100 hour fighter or 72. It doesn't really have the takedowns. I mean, if anything, what's going to happen is Dolgarian will go for takedowns and then run out of gas or something. So it's not as if you're ever going to get three rounds of takedowns from, from C Rod. So Oh, I have to think about this one. Normally, I would just naturally take take uh, C Rod because you know, the, it's the. I would imagine Dolgarin is going to be, if not the most popular, or at least close to the most popular fighter. Um, so to get him for some leverage against Dolgarin, but nonetheless, I mean, hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, second. Respond to this. So nonetheless, Dolgarian is, is certainly, I mean, in my opinion, like the best play, right? I mean, he's only 8,500 and he just scores through the roof in his wins. So I don't know. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on. We have Ovan Ovan Saint Pru versus Kennedy and Zichuku. And it's kind of a brutal spot here. I mean, he's ninety four hundred, and I imagine he's probably favored to to get the get the finish in a pretty pretty fine style here. Let's take a look. Uh, and Juku inside the distance is minus 315. I mean, what are you going to do? Just got to play him. I, I've heard it argued that he, you know, has he's a slow starter maybe. And maybe if he doesn't get that finish until the second round, he won't get there. And yet, yes, that is true. Um, but even so, he's like plus 112 or whatever to, to win in round one. And you know that those are those are big scores. He can get he can get three knockdowns. And he, you know what I mean? He can he can win in the first minute. You know what I mean? Like this is just uh, these scores are just really really big when you get these first round KOs. So uh, he doesn't really have the takedown upside. So he's not gonna 
It's not going to be the guy to ground and pound St. Pru. It's going to be like probably like knockdown, knockout, maybe 110. Is 110 going to be enough? Maybe. Maybe not, but it's not like it's 9,600, 9,400. I mean, it is reasonable. So, I mean, you have to make him a priority. I mean, it's just is inside the distance line is just too strong. All right. Um, and then St. Pru on the other side. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> then Jiku is going to be like really popular. You got some leverage against St. Pru. He just doesn't win this fight enough. He wins the fight, you know, 15% of the time. So it's just not going to be good enough. However, <laughs> let's say this. Uh, let's 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 be devil's play devil's advocate for a minute. So his inside the distance line is plus spot seven fifty, which means that's about ten percent of the time. He's probably not going to be more than ten percent owned. And I'll tell you this: if he does win, he's going to be optimal. We'll talk about this when we get to the one fifty maxing, I guess, but. He's at the very most a big dart throw in like your, you know, in the last 10 or so of your 150 set. All right. Um, Brian Battle versus Ange Lusa. So now I think we're going to get to what I think is the most popular. Well, one of the two most popular underdogs on the slate. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Well, I'll go back to that in a second. Yeah, Brian Battle against Ange Lusa, minus 180 versus plus one, I guess, 150 or so. Um, Take a look at the prices, 8,600 versus 7,600. That, that all makes sense. So Brian Battle for 8,600. We're expecting to see an inside the distance line if we want to play it. But maybe plus 140. That, sh that should work. Let's take a look. It's only plus 200, so not very good. Not the greatest play in the world. And then on the other side, you have Lusa with an inside the distance line of plus 460, which also isn't good. But the thing is, is that Lusa has quite a bit of takedown upside. We will look at him, and he had six takedowns in his last fight. Um, two takedowns in the fight before that against A.J. Fletcher, who's also a wrestler. Um, and not only that, but he had 240 minutes seconds of control time like four full full minutes um excuse me 241 uh sorry strikes he had th he had five full minutes of control control time and this is um this is how you score <laughs> you, know, you, you get takedowns and you stay busy uh is he gonna get the takedowns i don't know but if he does he's going to score so this is a be a very, very strong underdog play. And again, the only reason I would play battle in spite of the inside the distance line is because again, if, if, if Lusa is going to be a very popular underdog, then getting leverage against him probably makes sense, which is why, again, I go back to that fight I talked about earlier, this, uh, that women's fight, the, uh, not the Chandler fight, the, uh, the McKenna Amarim fight, the Amarim at 8K, well, I don't want to call that an underdog, really, but she's got to be very popular, wouldn't you think? With her inside the distance line. Uh, so as a result, I would think McKenna would be a good bit of leverage. So likewise, in this fight, you have um, Angelusa, very, very good underdog, because in his wins, he scores well. So then Battle, even though his metrics don't look so great, you probably get some sneaky leverage there. So I think these four fighters are going to be probably the key, you know, to, to this, to this card, you know, because I think I look, everybody's going to play Dolgarian. I would say everybody. It's a tremendous play. They're going to, they're going to, everybody's going to take a shot at some of these nine K's. You can make a case for all of them. You know? Mearshart. Uh, what's his name? And Chuku, obviously Mike Davis. Filio even, well, Filio is actually a pretty good mid range play here. Um, uh, and I think that these fights are a little sneaky. The, the Lusa battle, the Ken of Amarin. I think if you get the, if you play the other sides of these, now again, this is getting more into line of constructions, like stuff like battle and McKenna. So those, those could be pretty interesting in GPPs. Um, but 
again, we're not talking about that specifically here, but, but Lusa again, very, very strong underdog play because in his wins, he scores well, and he wins often enough where we, you know, where we can, we can play him. Uh, then we get to the main event, Tai Tuivasa versus Martin Tybura. Again, another mid-range fight uh, where the winner is going to score something. You know, it is a heavyweight fight, so there's always going to be some knockout upside. And there's al it's also a heavyweight fight, so it's always possible to get a kind of a boring one. But the thing is, is that we talk about in these five-round fights, which fights are more likely to benefit from the five rounds than others. And I think this one is going to, in a sneaky way, it's really going to benefit from the five rounds. And, and the reason for that is that the heavyweight fights usually do go one of two ways. You know, they, they either just come like a first round slugfest or just, they're both just way durable. And this fight just goes a sloppy five rounds. And when that happens, or sloppy three rounds, right? So when that happens, you're going to need those five rounds of significant strikes to make up for the fact that uh, you won't might might not get a finish. So sometimes you get these heavyweight fights that that rate to finish in the first round, and in those you don't need the five rounds. So it's kind of silly to give it extra juice. But here, I don't think this is necessarily finishes in the first round. Let's let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here. Um, it does, fight does, fight goes, does, fight, go, fight does not go, this is, is pr pretty big favorite. So maybe everything I just said is BS, but, well, I don't know. Tuivasa inside the distance minus 115, Tybor inside this 115. So they're each favored to finish, but not by a lot, right? That's, you know, it's, so, so, um, what is this all about? How, how can Tuivasa be minus 110 inside? Tybura be minus 110 inside? And the fight goes a distance, be plus 500. That's ridiculous. That's why you, that's why that's why these prop markets are overseen. Mm -hmm. Um but let's 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 take a look here. On the under 1.5 rounds, minus 110. I still think though that because of the nature of heavyweight fights that the five rounds are going to help, which basically means that you have to play one of these two. I mean, like, they're either going to get a finish or they're not. And, and if they're not, then they're going to get probably five rounds of significant strikes where you're going to score probably 90 points. So so I think both these fighters are very, very playable. And I, no, I don't have my opinion on which one I like more. Um, So... What, is, what does all this mean to the average man? What this means, again, it's a very, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a normal type of card nowadays because you're seeing like some good favorites, but then again, you might not even have to play it. You know, like if you, if you could build like a lineup set with say, you know, one of these guys, one of these guys, uh, one of these girls, um, where where's the new you know what I mean like new I mean you could you can get away with 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 not playing any big underdogs. Where's Dolgarian? Like you play you play Dolgarian and that and then I mean, then you could play you could play whatever you want and I you can go play your and 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 I'm not saying to play this but like this lineup for example I think it's gonna be really popular. Because it's so easy. Um, nonetheless, that that's probably what you're supposed to do. Delgarian, probably the best play. Luce is probably the best underdog, and whoever the whoever you like here, Tybura or Tuivasa, whoever you like here, uh, Amarim McKenna, you know. And yeah, you could play in other ways. You could try to. You could try to play these barbells where you get all these favorites and then try to get lucky with like Barbarena or or Natan Levy or Chad Ellinger and something like that. But I don't know. It just seems easier to let low, a, lot, let a lot lower stress to play this way. All right. That'll do it. Um, we're going to do a betting breakdown tomorrow. And then we're going to do a full lineup construction video where we use Saber Sim and use the contest sims and things like that. 
to try to win the uh, the 150, uh, the 150 minutes. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.